Hello, and welcome to Healthcare on the Rocks, Employee Benefits with a Twist. I'm Jennifer Jones, Population Health Practice Leader at Springbuck. And I'm Mike Pattengale, Senior Account Executive for Channel Sales. In this podcast, we talk with employers, benefit advisors, technology innovators, and other experts in wellness, human resources, and healthcare. Our guest today is Megan Nail, who is Vice President of Total Rewards Practice at First Person Advisors, now a subsidiary of NFP. Megan advises clients on how to meet their organization's goals through total rewards and compensation strategy. She builds and designs market competitive base and incentive pay structures throughout the organization, including prioritizing compensation as a key component of the employer's value proposition. Megan strives to create engaging workplaces that value talent by aligning an organization and its goals. This enables her to design valuable compensation structures that attract, engage, and retain top talent. With over 12 years experience as a volunteer leader at the Society for Human Resources Management, as we all know as SHRM, Megan has invested in building and strengthening Indiana's HR community. She is currently the State Director of HR for Indiana SHRM. So Megan, welcome to the show. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. Well, we have a couple different questions that we just wanted to fire at you today, Megan. Uh, Excited to have you on the show, and I think there are just a lot of topics here that come to mind. So uh, I'll go ahead and start it off here. I'm curious, what are some of the top-of-mind topics for Indiana Sure members these days? Yeah, I do think that total rewards and the value that it plays as you're trying to recruit and retain talent is top of mind. So all of the HR professionals that I'm talking to are really struggling with what is their value proposition to employees as our labor market has been so tight right now and it's so hard to recruit employees. Everyone's looking for what that differentiator is so they can hopefully retain the talented folks that they have and then also recruit those new employees in. And I think with part of that, what people and what organizations are really looking at is how they can be creative in meeting what their employees' new needs are, um, especially in the benefits area, looking at things like family benefits and mental health and all of those different things that have changed for a lot of us over the past two years and just trying to really assess what that is. I think you brought up um, two really hot buttons that we get asked a lot of questions around more from a, you know, a data and a strategy perspective as well. The mental health, um, the family planning, and then we've had a ton of discussions recently as well around DEI, so diversity, equity, inclusion, and then social determinants of health. Do you see a lot of employers focusing um, on those particular topics as well? For sure. And I think part of it, it's interesting to me, both on the benefits and the compensation side, really what's coming out of that DEI focus. And we're seeing a lot of things and a lot of really good questions and pressure in a healthy way being put back to us as HR professionals or, um, you know, benefits professionals really asking those questions about access to care. Um, What are some of those different ways that we can ensure that our total population is supported? Um, family planning benefits for um, LGBTQ um, couples, just really thinking about what that all is and how we can holistically support people. On the compensation side, we're seeing a ton on that too. So beyond just having to be really competitive on compensation and what that looks like, but making sure that our pay equity is in line and that everything that we're offering our employees really reflects what our diversity and inclusion and equity policies are and just who we want to be as a company culturally. Yeah, absolutely. And then one, one last question on that topic, as you spoke about um, income and, you know, do you see where people are aligning Um, premiums and, you know, looking at the whole compensation package as a percentage of, you know, an an employee's total um, income, essentially. So not going over to make that truly affordable for them. I'll I'll get to that point here. (laughs) Yeah, no, you're right, um, Jen. It's really just looking at what that total package is and then what the unique needs are and what the unique desires are of different employee populations. So I think we know that 
um, you know, just speaking very generically, different generations maybe have different priorities within their total rewards package or just different levels of income might have different needs in different ways. So even looking at things um, around your health plan and if you've got um, the opportunity to provide some voluntary benefits that help really shore up maybe some of those um, lower income earners so they're not as exposed should they have a serious health event if they're on a high deductible plan. Or just looking at, for example, in compensation for your higher income earners, maybe they want to put in a deferred compensation plan or something more creative along those lines. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really understanding who your employees are and what their needs are and then what value you can provide in different ways for that entire package. And then really importantly, how you communicate that as a package. Mm -hmm. Because what I see a lot is we make really great decisions in silos and we add a benefit, we give a compensation increase, we give a bonus, but how are we constantly reminding people of everything they're receiving from the organization um, when we're all so busy and have a million messages coming at us every day? Yeah, great points there. Um, given your role as president of HR Indiana, can you share some of the challenges you've seen for HR leaders over the last year? I know you've touched on some, but would love to hear just some of the other challenges that, that you're hearing from others within that. It's been a really challenging environment for HR over the past year and a half. And although, you know, we don't face challenges like our frontline workers who are in the healthcare system providing that type of frontline support, we are frontline to our employees. And when they have a benefits challenge, they have a compensation challenge, maybe they have a financial hardship, we're often that trusted advisor to our employees in that first call that they receive. So really um, just thinking about weighing heavily on us the safety of our employees, but also the ability to run our businesses and to support our companies so that we can have the staff that we need to move forward and so forth. It was interesting. I was at the Sherm National Conference earlier this um, in September here in 2021, and it was at the time when the new guidance came out about vaccines and the mandate for employers over 100. And it was an interesting place to be because really, I saw HR professionals at that conference visibly just emotional over, it's another thing, how are we gonna implement this? How are we really going to make this happen for our organization? Um, because when it comes down to it, we're the ones that have to make it happen and really work with, with our providers um, to make it again, a safe environment for our employees. I often joke that over the past year and a half, I feel like everything that I knew about HR has changed um, over my 20 years. We have paid FMLA, we have quarantine leave, we're taking employees' temperatures, and if you would have asked me two years ago if any of that would have been true, I would have told you no. Yeah, that's so true. I'm curious, how does total rewards play a role in compensation trends that you're seeing, uh, not only currently, but what's to come in 2022 and, and maybe even 2023? Yeah, um, I have never seen a compensation market like this in my 20-year career in HR. We're seeing individuals receive huge offers, um, base pay, uh, six-figure sign-on bonuses for roles that are paying, you know, maybe 150000 So you're not talking about a six-figure sign-on bonus for a, you know, a seven-figure employee. It's just really competitive right now. And I think there are a couple of things at play that are causing that. Um, of course, first, we have the challenges in the labor market and just the available talent supply is certainly a huge driver. Um, we also have, with remote work for so many positions, a ton of geographic pressure that's coming in from different markets. So if you're in the Midwest or in a lower cost market and you have big firms or companies that are offering East West Coast rates and recruiting people that they can stay here in Indiana um, and really you know, pay those rates, then that is a new competition that we haven't seen from kind of out of market generally. And then the third piece I think is transparency. So there's a lot of movement legislatively towards pay transparency, um, particularly in Colorado as kind of a shining example. And so as more pay information is out there, it not only empowers employees to know their worth, 
but also it empowers employers positively or negatively to go out and see what their competitors are paying and then also poach those um, those individuals. So it's been interesting. And I think with that, Mike, back to your, your main question, how can we use that total rewards picture to help round that out and to make it more than about money? Um, because I know that a lot of the clients I work with, they can't match a six-figure signing bonus. So how can you widen that conversation and really make it about how our total rewards picture supports you and how our culture makes a difference? So that's how I see it coming together. Yeah, thank you. Um, and not to steal all the thunder here, Jen, I just had one question that came out of that. What What are some of the most unique or kind of shocking rewards that you've seen come out? I know one, uh, we had a coworker, um, you know, go elsewhere, and, and a big reason was they got a an Uber Eats stipend every, every month, which I am jealous of. I didn't know that that existed, <laughs> but was curious as to what some of those really unique ones that you're seeing are out there. Yeah, great question. Um, first off, that sounds amazing. I haven't heard about the Uber Eats, so I'm going to have to share that with some more people. I would definitely take advantage of that. Um, so, they're, they're a client of yours. That oh, that good. Be, so, yeah. <laughs> I've also heard of Netflix, so Netflix reimbursement. Um, a big piece of what I'm hearing about is more on that work-life balance and not really looking at t- traditional time off like PTO or something because we all know when you take PTO, it's hard. Your email box is still going to be full. If you actually can even disconnect, we'll just get that out of the way when you come back. So going to company days off um, where the whole company, the whole organization is shut down on that day, kind of like a holiday. Um, So I recently talked to an employer, and they were giving the last Friday of every month as a company day off, a company well-being day. So basically adding an additional 12 holidays to what their package is. I thought that was pretty creative. Kind of going back to diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, one creative benefit that I saw for an organization that for a lot of their roles require kind of some after hours events or sales meetings or things that require people to be outside of the traditional business hours and outside of their home during that time was a babysitting stipend. So if you had children and you were in one of these roles and you received um, a stipend for every time you had one of these after hours events to help you cover your child care costs during that time. Um, I thought that was very creative and just thinking about really, again, to that point of meeting your employees' needs where they are and, and just how you can help support that. That's really interesting. I had read a blog about that um, from an, a woman who was in sales who felt like she could never get ahead um, because she was a single mom and she couldn't meet everyone after work for drinks. She couldn't go out, you know, for dinner a lot because she had to worry about childcare too. So I think it's an interesting take on how childcare, you know, can affect the total employee experience too. So that's, that's really, those are all really interesting, I think, to see how people are getting creative with those types of incentives. I think, you know, two part question then for you is how sustainable do you think this is or how long do you think it will last? Um, and then kind of a follow up to that is like, what strategies do you see uh, employers putting together to make a sustainable plan for uh, compensation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's one that I ask myself, too. I I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I did. But one thing I do know based on my experience is it's really hard to take money away from people. So I've heard a lot of, um, you know, owners or HR professionals asking, well, is the market going to correct and we're going to see compensation levels come back down? And should we hedge against that and not give increases and, and things like that? I have a hard time seeing that. Of course, during the heat of the pandemic, when things are really, really uncertain, we did see some organizations giving pay cuts. Pretty quickly later into 2020, those were pretty much given back for most businesses, um, most organizations. So I see with the way inflation is rising and just those compensation rates are rising in general, I don't know what the correction is going to be, but I think from a talent attraction and retention standpoint, I don't think you can count on that happening um, Mm -hmm. anytime soon. So it's, it's hard, but taking pay away 
is something that I think is generally a last resort for most. I'm curious, how have you continued to engage with your employees in a remote work environment? Yeah, it's it's really hard. Um, I think it's really, and part of it is, too, just thinking about culturally, kind of going back to different work styles, different types of people, different situations, how to really support that asynchronous communication. So knowing that we need to work together, we need to collaborate, and we want to keep that as part of our culture and, and part of our working relationship is important. But, you know, I might be a night owl and I log on at, you know, 10 p.m. at night to try to finish up a project. If I'm being honest, I'm a morning person. So uh, emails for me at 5 a.m. aren't too, aren't totally out of the question. So just thinking about how can you be purposeful on your communication and what those connections are and still allow that flexibility for for people to work when it works for them, when it works around their situation, and when they're most productive. Um, so I think, Mike, to your question, being intentional about a mix of communication, video, phone, Slack, or Teams, whatever tools you use, but just keeping in mind that balance between too much and we're feeling like we're on all the time with Zoom and then not enough connection, which we know is a problem too. Yeah, I think it is pretty nice working remotely. I can get a lot more done in a day. I'm sure Jen can get even more done because I'm not bugging her standing at her (laughs) desk telling a stupid joke or a story. But uh, yeah, there is a weird balance. Yeah. So uh, I'm in our office right now. Uh, one of two people. I just do it for nostalgia's sake. But um, it is nice just to be remote, have that time to, you know, get done what you need. But I think that balance of still feeling that uh, connectivity to your team and and the rest of the folks is really important. So thanks for sharing. That's super helpful. Yeah, I agree. And I think what I'm seeing kind of to the other extreme, um, and this is just my personal take, is I'm seeing some companies going to the other extreme of we all need to be back in the office because it's our culture. And to me, that's a little bit of a cop-out answer. Figure out how you can maintain your culture with whatever the right work environment is. And we know that certain jobs, you can't be remote. It's just not what the nature of the job is, and that's okay. But what is, how can you maintain that connection? How can you maintain that communication? And have in-person as a part of it, if it makes sense for your company, but really determine what your culture is in the new normal and not just take the easy answer of, well, we need to be together to really maintain what our culture is. Definitely. Well, Megan, you know, our podcast name is healthcare on the rocks, employee benefits with a twist. What would you say is the biggest twist uh, you've seen in employee benefits during your career? Wow. Great. Great question. I would say, honestly, and I probably have a little recency bias here, but one of the biggest twists for me has been um, student loan repayment and financial wellness and how that has all come into the picture. Um, That's not something that I would have thought, you know, just a couple of years ago would become this increasing part of our package. But I think for a lot of companies, as we're looking at trying to recruit younger talent, Um, And again, looking at what's important to them, helping them in all aspects of their financial wellness, not just focusing on retirement, which is what our traditional focus is, and looking Mm -hmm. at some more near-term goals, I think has been a really healthy twist as we just think about what that population is and how we're setting people up for success. Um, A lot of, and this is near and dear to our heart within HR Indiana SHRM, is a world of work that works for all and just thinking about all different types of people and really being cognizant of different different people have different opportunities and how can we provide valuable, meaningful careers and work opportunities for all. And I think programs like student loan repayment, training, tuition, that can really help when you look at the cost of, of some of those education um, outlays, so to speak, and what would be required. Do you think we could get Springbuck to pay for our dependence college? Because I have two approaching way sooner than I want. <laughs> that would be a phenomenal benefit. I. <laughs> That's a good question. So just when you're on that creative total rewards, I was just talking to a company yesterday that they offer a scholarship for children 
um, that is a benefit that's available if the kids receive, you know, a certain GPA in college. So maybe you could look at that for a benefit. Yeah. I like it. Let's talk to Nicole. (laughs) Yeah, I was about to say, we need to send this entire episode to Nicole so that she has to hear it. Oh, well, thank you so much again, Megan. We've really enjoyed uh, your comments today. It's been really insightful. I think, you know, we get so focused on the data, but to hear, you know, the the, the personal side as we think about employee benefits um, is really exciting. And, and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today. I was going to say, I think that's the perfect pairing is really between mm-hmm. having the data to support whatever you're looking to do and then having that personal side too. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So that's it for this episode of Healthcare on the Rocks, Employee Benefits with a Twist. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to rate us or leave a review on your favorite podcast platform that helps other people find the show and lets us know what you like. And remember to subscribe so you won't miss an episode. To find our previous episodes and more, visit our website at springbuck.com forward slash podcast. Until next time. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.